Now we come to another hot topic, and it's the topic of cryptocurrencies. And Max already asked you, um, just in his uh, panel discussion here, who exactly understands uh, Bitcoin? Oh, yeah, one person, fantastic. Blockchain, Ethereum. Yeah, it's pretty high. Ah, yay! That was actually, a, I think, a really a good explanation so far. The best I heard. Uh, yes. And, um, yeah, it's still, these are currencies. And Meinhardt, he is actually, he's running a startup, uh, Satoshi Pay, which is fully focusing on Bitcoin. So if you're interested to learn more about Satoshi Pay, you will find Meinhardt at the startup booth uh, upstairs. So, um, a peer-to-peer -peer system to move value between parties without third-party intervention, more or less. And um, I really think it's so interesting because nobody really understands the technology so far, besides from uh, some experts. So nobody can really say what is the threat or the chances for the financial industry. And um, there have been uh, very volatile movie movements uh, in this whole field. So it was not really sure, nobody was really sure should I invest into Bitcoin or not. And um, but. Though it was like this, there was always a very strong community that drove Bitcoin even further. And uh, the company Bitstamp just uh, announced last week that they received a fully uh, regulatory license uh, from the EU, uh, from Luxembourg. So this is, I think, a big, big achievement. Maynard, do you say it's a... Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. It's good for you and for your community. So, um, so there is some movement in there. And our next speaker, uh, Peter Smith, he is uh, the founder and CEO of Blockchain. He will elaborate a bit more on the technology and uh, on the possibilities. And Peter, if you, if you mention Blockchain, you definitely have to uh, mention Peter. They are around since 2011, uh, founded somewhere close to London. And uh, they have around 7 million active users of their Bitcoin wallet. So widely spread service. And uh, Peter uh, is now going to explain us a bit more about the use cases of Bitcoin and uh, what we will be expecting in the future. So please give it up for Peter Smith. Thanks. It's uh, great to be here in Berlin today. Um, this couch just, it looks so comfortable. So I'm going to try giving a talk from, from the couch for the first couple minutes. Um, Berlin's one of my favorite cities. It's where my family's originally from. Uh, we immigrated to the States in the 50s, um, so a while ago. I don't speak German, which is always the next question when I tell people that. Um, I've been living in London and in Europe for a long time, and so I'm really passionate about the startup community in Europe. I'm really excited to see other startup communities build outside of Europe. And I'm always really excited uh, to come to Berlin and meet with people here. Berlin has some of the best um, experts on uh, distributed networks and cryptocurrencies and blockchains in the world. Um, you're going to hear from one of those people next, an actual serious engineer. Um, you know, I, I'm probably a, a retired engineer who's a shitty engineer now. Um, the guy you're going to hear from next is actually still a great engineer, so you should be really excited about that. Um, blockchain, as the intro said is four years old now. And so we've been around, I think, just about as long as anybody else. Um, we're about a week older than Coinbase, which is the other really large and old company in the space. We've got about 45 employees. Um, we do anywhere from 70 to 100,000 transactions a day. To give you some perspective on what that kind of number means, um, most other sort of peer-to-peer -peer money apps that you see in the market uh, do no more than 15,000 transactions a day. And so we have a huge volume um, with a low amount of people. We bootstrapped for the first few years of the company's existence. Um, and then now we're backed by about $35 million uh, um, from Sand Hill VCs in California. Um, There's a hypothetically, oh yeah. The digital world is a part of our DNA now. 
It's how we share our experiences, how we consume our entertainment, how we stay in touch with our loved ones. This is how we used to send letters, to travel, to make phone calls and shoot movies. Mankind invented software and technologies, breaking every distance, border, difficulty, and pulling the world instantly closer together. But what about banking? Think about it. Billions of people in the world have no access to financial tools. Borders and the system create barriers. We trusted banks, but they collapsed time and time again. They take hundreds of billions in fees from us. Bitcoin doesn't care where you're born, what color your skin is, or where you are in the world. It's an open network. It's maintained equally by people all over the world. Anyone can verify the transactions, and it happens instantly. For just a few cents, you can send any amount of money to anywhere in the world. Bitcoin is a global community of inclusion, an invitation to participate in an open world. Join us today, start a Bitcoin wallet, and help us shape the future. So over the years, we got a lot of feedback that I do a bad job of explaining what the real vision behind the Bitcoin network is, that I would constantly go too deep into engineering. And so I told our uh, marketing team that if they thought they could do better, they should try. So that's, their, that's their, their shot at it. It's the first time we've played the video. So if you have feedback, my email's at the end of the deck. I would love feedback on the video. We plan to use it pretty widely. At the end of the day, what this technology about is about, and it gets so much hype. You hear basically an incredible amount of hype in the business press, in the financial press, in the tech press. We've reached like a peak hype cycle now. And what this technology is really about is putting an existing industry almost entirely out of business. And so what this technology does, what secure data access for value transfer does at the end of the day, is remove intermediaries. Our financial system today is largely reliant on central administrators. Whether you're talking at a very small level, like your local bank, which is a central administrator, or at a very high level, which is a central bank, which is a central administrator. This technology removes the need for those type of institutions. The reason to remove those institutions is because there's a real cost to intermediaries. People don't take risk for you know, a charity. And so by removing those intermediaries, you can increase efficiency, and more importantly, you can deliver products to more people around the world. So blockchain, we're building the soft player platform that will power the world's open financial future. What we're trying to do is re-engineer banking for the information age, which means delivering more access and more control to individual users. People often ask me why digital currency is the future. Like, why don't we just continue what we're doing in fintech for the last 10 years, which is fintech companies build a slightly better consumer experience on top of the existing infrastructure? And the answer is, the existing infrastructure is shit. If you work in financial services, you know that no matter how many times you build a clever mobile banking app, the underlying platform, the underlying network is insecure, it's terribly inefficient, and it's terribly, terribly divided. To the extent that even in the United States, where you have one huge giant market, and Europeans often think things work very well in the US because it's one market, if you try to get money from uh, New York to Philadelphia, It'll take you three days. You can literally walk there faster than you can digitally send your money. And so we can keep building these new consumer experiences off top shitty infrastructure, or you know, we as technologists can rebuild the underlying infrastructure. And I think that's why digital currency will be the future. Now, the future might not be a digital currency that no one administers. A central bank could issue a digital currency. And we've already seen the beginnings of that with the Bank of England, as well as the Monetary Authority in Singapore. I think that's a really competitive uh, product if it was in the market. It might do better than digital currencies which aren't managed by anyone. But the underlying idea is an efficiency platform. It's a gutting of the current infrastructure, and that's going to happen in some shape or form, no matter what shape it takes. If you think about the evolution, even in my lifetime, when I got my first bank account, I deposited some cash, not much. 
and they gave me checks. They gave me these special pieces of paper that if I filled them out and gave them to someone, the bank promised to honor that commitment. Unless, of course, the check bounced, which is like a three-month process back then. When my parents would go to the grocery store, they would buy groceries with a check. This behavior over the last 15, 20 years has entirely disappeared. And what we've gotten is a digitization on top of that, right? We've gotten these debit cards. Now, the issue with the debit card is that it's still built on top of the same technology infrastructure that the check was, right? So we have a new front end with this little piece of plastic, but we're still on the same analog, centrally administered database that isn't very efficient. What are we getting now? Now we're getting e-wallets. In, in the screenshot, you see a picture of our wallet, right, which is a radically different e-wallet. It relies on a globally distributed uh, blockchain protocol called Bitcoin. But we're also getting banking e-wallets, right? And those banking e-wallets are still relying on the same infrastructure. And so we're continually inventing these new front ends, but we haven't invented the underlying. I think that now what you're seeing in the industry with people talking about blockchain technology, people talking about cryptocurrencies, digital currencies, is a fundamental shift in the underlying layer behind the consumer experience. So I think, and sometimes I jump on my slides, I personally think what's going to happen is we're going to race to the most efficient network. So if you look at information, if you look at technology where people you know, we shifted from printed encyclopedias to encyclopedias on disks to Wikipedia, things have a tendency to shift to the most open, most efficient platform, which is why at our company, we really believe that the most value will be generated by software and services that are built on top open networks. The two best open networks today are Ethereum, which is a new network, which I think you'll hear about from Christian next, um, and has a lot of promise. But the only one that's really in production, the only blockchain in the world actually that has any production products on it today is Bitcoin. I want to skip to a slide since I'm running out of time. This is the kind of progress that we're seeing on people using the Bitcoin blockchain. So this is just the last three years. In 2013, our company did 4 million transactions on top of the Bitcoin protocol. In 2014, we did 10 million, and in 2015, we did 21 million. This year, we're on pace for 40 million. By comparison's sake, when PayPal went public, they went public with about the 2014 numbers, right? So this is incredibly fast growth, and it shows a real demand for a more efficient, more global payment network. And now I'm out of time, so thank you. I appreciate it. So, Peter, how do then traditional banking houses react to you when you tell them that they all be out of business? Yeah, so I, I don't actually think banking houses will go out of business. I think like a lot of other technology, a lot of other companies, a lot of industries, banks have to make a switch from being a bank or a custodian, you know, uh, with that kind of relationship to being technology companies. And a lot of banks are actually making great progress on this. So. We first started talking to banks about the underlying technology of blockchain and distributed ledgers and all that good stuff about three and a half years ago. And some banks are making excellent progress. Some banks are making no progress at all. Um, and so I think just like we've seen media companies become technology companies, and we've seen information companies become technology companies, we've even now seen car companies become technology companies, the same thing will happen in banking. The question is how many of them make that jump? So, and for me as a consumer, how long will it take then before I can make my grocery shopping then with a Bitcoin wallet? What do you think? So, if you're in the United States, you already can. Uh, there's a bank in the United States called USAA, um, and it's one, of, it's one of the larger credit unions in the United States, which is a cooperative company, um, and you can already do that uh, with your USAA account in the United States. So, and uh, which other markets are most advanced? Yeah, so I think there is, there's two questions there. One are which are most advanced. I think the most advanced market in the world is probably the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, number 10 there has been really, really progressive about the technology, has really gone out of their way to encourage the technology to be developed in the United Kingdom. 
We've enjoyed tremendous support from the British government. Um, in terms of growth, though, in terms of sheer number of users, what you find with these kind of low friction, low cost technologies is that users tend to adopt them in parts of the world where they don't have other choices. Mm -hmm. So just like you saw messaging apps like WhatsApp or Viber adopted in emerging markets, you see the same thing with Bitcoin. And so huge swaths of our user base are in Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, Latin America. There's not as big of a market need for these services in, for example, Germany, where payments are pretty good. So how do you see WeChat, for example, as a chatting platform, but also as a possibility to transfer money? Yeah, so WeChat is actually, of all mobile payment apps, has the highest payments volume in the world. So WeChat in one day did more payments volume than PayPal did in a year. So WeChat's already the largest, uh, largest payments platform in the world for an e-wallet. In China, I think Bitcoin is mostly a speculative commodity. Um, the reality is that between Alipay and WeChat, um, there's a really strong incentive for people to use those platforms because it ha it's how the government injects basically consumer liquidity into the market. So I don't see, think that you'll see uh, Bitcoin used as a payment mechanism in China, but I think you'll see it used as a commodity or as an asset hedge. So which are the areas then where Bitcoins might uh, bring most value to? So customers usually fall into three segments. The first is people who are technologists, so it's people like in this room who have a tendency to be under the age of 45. Um, technical, really interested in the underlying parts of the technology. The next segment is people who want a way to pay for things online and don't have another way. Um, a lot of times this is young people um, buying digital goods. And then the third segment is folks who live in um, economically turbulent countries. So this would be a country like Argentina or the Ukraine um, where their own currency is very volatile and they want to have some of their net worth tied up in something that isn't tied to their government. Talking a bit about your name, blockchain, um, this is sometimes a bit confusing and we spoke about that one on the phone already, um, but uh, can you maybe explain again uh, how it comes that you have the same name and you're as a company name as the technology is named? Because I think a lot of people might not really know that. Sure, it's, it's actually a funny story. So in the early days of Bitcoin companies, almost every Bitcoin company named themselves after some technical part of the protocol. So for example, another company that's been a long time is called Coinbase. A Coinbase is actually part of a mining transaction. When we named our company, uh, essentially we put up like four ideas on an internet poll. And um, blockchain was the, was the top choice. Um, and so it's kind of interesting because you know, we're one of the largest brands in the space. We're the largest user of, of blockchain technology in the space. And then of course, um, we're also named for the underlying technology that we use. Can you talk a bit about other use cases than just money transfer regarding to blockchain? Sure. I think it's really important for people to realize that we're in incredibly early stages of this ecosystem. So I tell people to join our company, it's going to be a 10 to 20 year grind. Um, and I think it probably will be even longer. What we're seeing now and our company is focused on is figuring out how we can extend these protocols to support more advanced use cases. And so, you know, I think insurance is fundamentally one of the most valuable things to humans. The ability to collectively pool risk is what transforms societies, right? And so we need to figure out how to use either um, the current protocols that we're using or new protocols to build uh, products that have more depth and more financial complexity. And I think you'll see us and the industry at large start to do that over the next couple of years. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just one feedback uh, to the video. I really mm. like it. It makes it really much uh, more understandable. I like that it's so emotional and it shows people. And um, yeah, the, the vision that you have uh, provokes the feeling, yeah, I would like to support this. So I cool. think it works. Thanks. Okay. If anybody has any questions or they want to get in touch, um, my email's there. I, I actually do respond to all the emails. Great. Cheers. Thank you very much, Peter.